What's up, everybody? It's your girl Lima here. Welcome to the first episode of Alasara. You're about to listen to a call between myself and an entrepreneur just like you. He is an international actor, filmmaker, and activist. He's one of the few actors who speaks multiple languages and has traveled the world to create authentic projects. He'll explain his journey and what he's been working on. Hopefully, you can listen and get inspired. Without further ado, here's Momo Dion. What's going on, everybody? My name is Momo Dion. I'm an actor and filmmaker. My parents are from Guinea and Senegal, and I currently live in Los Angeles, California. So, Momo, do you want to start us from the beginning? How did this all come about? It's been an interesting journey. I was born in Riyadh. We stayed there until I was six, and then we moved to New York. And uh, my father is a diplomat for Guinea. And because of that, we were able to travel a lot all over the world, and we we're exposed to a lot of different things and exposed to a lot of different languages. I'm fluent in about four languages, but I understand or I'm conversational in maybe seven or eight. That just comes with it because in our country alone, we have a lot of languages already off jump. And then, you know, there's French and there's English and a little bit of Italian here and there from, um, you know, singing opera and practicing opera and, you know, other languages that I'm interested in that aren't from my country, but I'm just interested in those languages. But overall, you know, it's just it's an, been ama- an amazing journey. It's been tough sometimes to readjust and go to a new school, meet new people, but I think it's a skill that's helped me a lot in my filmmaking journey over the years because I could be on a set where maybe I don't love the material, maybe the energy isn't the greatest, or maybe the people who are making the project aren't necessarily the people that I would approach on any given day, but I'm able to you know, have a conversation with them and work and have a peaceful work environment and, you know, be productive and show them the amount of respect that they deserve and the amount of respect that I would like. So I think it's a good skill when you travel and made great skills or learn great skills, actually, from traveling and being forced to meet people, being forced to find your way, you know, being forced to survive <laughs> and then thrive in environments that if you would have asked me before we moved to that place or before I went to that school or before I had to, you know, disappear for a year and come back <laughs> or before I had to leave a, you know, a place that, you know, ended up a war zone, then you would definitely or I would definitely then say, no, I don't think I can make it there or I don't want to go there. But once you go, you're like, eh, it's not that bad. I survived. It's not that bad. We did it. We made it. How were you able to book all of your guests for your going home project? Well, the way that I was able to book my guests for the Going Home project was mostly through social media. I reached out to a lot of people before I got on the ground, and I was able to motivate them and inspire them to tell their story because some of them were shy at first, or some felt that they didn't accomplish enough or accomplish anything yet. And I let them know that I wasn't really looking for people who've accomplished anything. I was just looking for people who returned home or returned to their country of origin and who settled back home. And I wanted them to share the process of doing that so that it could motivate other people to do the same thing or let people know exactly what a trip of that sort entails and what some of the struggles and accomplishments are, you know, involved with that. Is there a secret time-saving technique you can share with everyone that helps you focus and tackle your most vital priorities each day? The thing that helps me focus I'm not sure if it's effective at saving time, even though I manage my time pretty well. But the thing that helps me focus is listening to music and meditation. I sometimes just stop what I'm doing, listen to one song or two songs, and close my eyes. I do some breathing. I speak to myself, and uh, I speak into existence what I'm trying to do or what I want to do or what I want to accomplish. I ask myself questions, and I seek uh, the answer. I do that quite often, actually, and it's almost like taking a deep breath, calming down, reassessing, and just starting from the beginning again. What else you enjoy doing besides filming, producing, and writing scripts? Well, I definitely love to watch films. I love to watch TV series. I love to write and create them. So everything around acting, filmmaking, audiovisual, the arts, I love music. I also like to cook. I like to eat. I like to dance. I enjoy dancing a lot. Traveling, I like going to the basketball court, <laughs> the gym, boxing, 
I like horseback riding, photography. I said food already. I love food. I like eating. I like trying new things. I like cooking. I like watching YouTube videos and uh, trying to match the food that they make. <laughs> but there's more. I, but those are the things that I love. Those are my passions, mostly. Anything audiovisual and uh, food, dancing, and social things. Tell us about the most influential lesson you ever learned from one of your mentors and how it helped you become the business owner you are today. I haven't had one specific mentor, but I had a tribe. I had a collection of people who were pivotal in my career who helped me in one way or another by giving me advice or giving me opportunities or letting me know about a particular audition or an audition for a character that I could play. And then that led to a career playing more characters like that and more opportunities or someone that led me to a particular acting school or someone that taught me a particular acting technique or someone that you know told me about a film festival that I was later nominated for or nominated at, or things like that. So I didn't have one specific person, but there are a lot of people. It takes a lot of people to really make it in this industry. You have your agent, you have your manager. If you get to a certain stage, you have a publicist, you have a lawyer, you have an acting coach, you have a voice coach. And if you get to another stage, then you have a movement coach. Then you have friends that help you record auditions. Then you have friends that just give you advice. Then you have friends who cheer you up when you're down. So if you're experiencing a period of not booking any jobs or you feel like things aren't working out, you have some friends that you talk to and they'll, they're will they like, hey, just forget about forget about all this. Let's just have some fun. And you know, they're mentors in essence because they help you a lot and they guide you in your career. Then you have some family members who are there for you when you need them. If you have a fundraiser, you can lean on them or they can give you advice. And uh, one valuable lesson that I learned was from my father, actually. He used to say in his, his accent, uh, there's no draft in life. And what he means by that is you only get one shot. You don't get you don't get a shot to do a first draft. So this right now, today, if this opportunity sees it like it's your last opportunity. Well, don't think, oh, if I'm going to mess up and do it again. No, this is it. Make it happen. So be on your, your P's and Q's. Be ready. Be prepared. And just do your best. Leave it all in the room. When you go in the audition room, leave it all in there. I love that. I love that. Absolutely. You only get one shot. Leave everything in the room. Name one person that you would love to work with. I mean, there are a lot of people, but one one person that I would love to work with is Aiza Maiga. She's a French Senegambian actress, and she's amazing, and I've watched a lot of her work. And uh, she just inspired me over the years because before, it was hard to get foreign films, and because of the IFC channel and then because of Netflix the DVD program, <laughs> when you could get three DVDs at a time, I would I watched almost all of her films, and she's just she's a great actress. She's a beautiful woman. She's a great actress, and she was one of the only prominent Black African French actresses in France. And I would see her in a lot of movies, and she plays different characters, and she just she motivated me a lot from afar and uh, I would love to work with her. And then also there's Usman Semben, who's uh, widely known as the the father of African cinema. He's deceased, but I would love to work I would have loved to work with him when he was alive. What is one of your daily habits you strongly believe contributes to your success? Yeah, for me, I just I have notes and I take meticulous notes and I have a to-do list. And every single day when I wake up, I try to decompress for like 10 minutes before looking at my phone. And then I look at my phone and I, and I, I go down the list one by one. I try to do as much or as many things as I can that are on that list in order of importance. And then I add more <laughs> as the day goes on. And every day I realize that I've added so many things that I'm not able to do all of them. But I at least did a lot or a little bit or I, I knocked off the important things. So that helps a lot. And that makes that keeps me on point to make sure I don't forget any important things. And so it's my to-do list and notes. Those are the, the, the two things that keep me on point. And also just remembering my goals and visualizing where I want to be, fit, you know, in terms of location or where I want to be in my career, when I, where I want to be in life. And that just keeps me motivated and, and reminds me not to waste time. And where can everyone find your merch? You can find my word, my merch right now at a website called Black Wealth Mafia. It's a collective by a friend of mine, and you can find my shop there, Going Home Shop, and you can see a lot of my shirts and hats and other things that we sell. BlackWealthMafia.com. I've made a conscious effort to mostly support black businesses, but there are some businesses that 
I um, so I'm supporting right now that are not black owned businesses because I pay my phone bill and I pay my internet bill <laughs> and <laughs> those are not black owned businesses. But aside from that, I'm supporting black businesses every single day. Tell us about your most exciting gig. The most exciting gig that I've ever had was definitely my first big role when uh, I was on Law and Order Criminal Intent. And to my surprise, Whoopi Goldberg was my mother in the episode. And she was so cool to work with. She made me very comfortable. She was just relaxed. She just relaxed me. And it was great. I was nervous, but I didn't act nervous <laughs> because... <laughs> She was amazing, and it was just great to, to work with her and to see how she worked and just relax, just calm down. Life is not that serious. <laughs> just do your best <laughs> and knock your roll out. You're here for a reason. So that just, it called me to the max, and we had a great time filming that. And that day was just a perfect day for me. I wish, I almost wish every day was like that day <laughs> or that week that we filmed, but it was just a great experience overall. And it was also the my first big job and my first job that officially made me a professional and where I, you know I earned a, I'm still earning money from that and a lot of my network has seen that so it's a it's an amazing thing a lot of people all over the world have seen it it plays a lot so that's definitely one of my my greatest uh, moments acting what sparked the creation of the going home series? It takes a lot of preparation. I have a good team of people that I work with and it takes time to really really prepare, figure out what we want to do, write it, assemble a team, get all the equipment we need, get the budget that we need and then we go and we make it happen, but it starts with a burning desire for storytelling and telling stories about people who look like us from the point of view of people who look like us or who are us. <laughs> and owning the means of production. So being able to produce it from beginning to end and put it out and making projects that appeal to us. So I want a project like this to be out to exist. And because I didn't find one, I, I decided to create one. And in this, at the same time, learning about my country of origin, teaching people about my country of origin and inspiring the people like me who want to go back and work from back home or work more back home and maybe even live back home to see that it's possible and to show them the people who have made the jump before they have and to show them actually from their mouths, not mine, what's going on, how it feels, what it took to get there, what needs to change, what's good, what's better than where they were, and just words of encouragement and the, the brutal, brutally honest truth. It's, it's a desire to do that. And then, of course, there's other things that I want to do. There are some African leaders that I wish had biopics that don't you know, or had series and there are things we want to develop little by little and we're working on it. We're developing it as time goes on and we're just taking it one day at a time. But we have a lot of things planned, a lot of projects. We're supposed to even be there now filming, but COVID-19 changed the plans a little bit. So we're reassessing and we're going to come back even better. Tell us, are you currently working on any projects? Well, what I'm working on or one project that I'm working on right now during covid is I'm preparing a documentary series on female genital mutilation. My mom has a women's organization, and for the last eight years, she's asked me to make a documentary about Guinean women who have experienced female genital mutilation and the side effects, how it affects their day-to-day -day lives, how to taboo that it often isn't spoken about, and how people aren't getting the treatment that they need mentally or physically. And uh, my mom for a long time has been going to villages and talking to women and, and girls about it, giving them support and things of that sort. So she asked me to make a film and I've teamed up with some women and we're working right now to make that a reality in 2021. How do you think women play a role in our society? Well, women are half the sky. So, and I love my mom. I love my mom. My mom still has my back to this day. She sacrificed a lot to give me the opportunity to even pursue what I want. You know, I was privileged enough growing up to be an actor. You know, I'm privileged enough to do that. I was privileged enough to come to the States and to have traveled all over the world and to have gone to some of the best schools and had some great opportunities and have a really good support system. 
I still take care of myself and I'm still motivated to be successful on my own as I have been since I was 18 years old when I graduated high school. But I have great parents. My mom and my dad have both inspired me. And, you know, it took it took some time for them to come around in terms of supporting the acting and the filmmaking because traditional African uh, households don't necessarily respect or see acting as a viable career or, or career choice. But they realized that I was serious. I was pretty good at it. Other people were telling them that. They saw the the work that I I did, and they saw that there was some success. And most importantly, I was taking care of myself. So they supported me, and now they're my biggest fans. But women are pivotal in my life. A lot of my friends, my confidants, a lot of the people who give me advice, who read my scripts first and give me notes, or who watch my projects, or who donate, or who invest in my project first, a lot of them are women. And I, I mean, I love women. I respect women. And I try to be the best man that I can to women. You know, with all the toxicity in the world and the toxic masculinity, I try to do better every day. I'm still a man, but I try to be better every day because I I respect women. And my sister also has helped me a lot. Both my sisters really have helped me a lot over the years, giving me advice and guidance. And some of the women that I've been in relationships with have helped me over the years and have, you know, opened doors for me and things like that. So goals, women are important. You you can't... uh, you just empower women to be themselves and to do what it is that they want to do. It's not about telling them what to do. It's about empowering them. This documentary on FGM is pretty much me empowering women to tell their story. Me saying, okay, I'll direct, I'll write. You guys have a conversation amongst yourselves and let me learn and let me and the rest of the world learn and, you know, let me or allow me to share your stories with the world. The things that you've told me and confided in me over the years, allow me to share this story with the world, to show them or to show the world what you're actually going through and what you've been going through and to help them understand what this is and why it's happening and and why it's still happening and some of the things you've experienced after how it's affected and is affecting your life and your mindset and what the, the, the lengths you've had to go through to protect your kids and your daughters from grandparents or from aunts or you know, rogue women in the neighborhood who practice this activity that you know, was culturally sanctioned or is culturally sanctioned in most places, but legally illegal. But it's part of the culture in a lot of places, and it still happens, unfortunately. And uh, this project is just a love letter to my mom and to all women. What's one thing you used to believe in that you no longer do? One thing that I used to believe in that I no longer believe in today is that celebrities or stars are gods. And when I say gods, I don't mean I revered them. But I mean, when you're around people a lot, you, you just you remember how human they are. And some people, you're, you love all their work. You love everything they've done. You love their accomplishments. You love the idea in your head that you have of them. As a child, sometimes you're like, well, I don't think I'll be able to do that. Or this is impossible. But then you see some people, you're like, man, I could do that. Or man, this person is not what I what I thought. They're just a great actor or a great actress. They're not what I thought. <laughs> so when you're a kid, you, you see these, these people and you revere them so much. And then you meet them and you're like... Man. Do you think that parents shouldn't idealize uh, other celebrities just because, you know, they admire them and they like them, but to actually let their kids actually choose and idealize their own superhero or their own role models instead? In that context, yes, I'm definitely preaching that parents should help and allow their kids to be themselves and people should strive to be their best selves and to find out who they are and to be themselves unapologetically. But at the same time, we just have to rethink the whole celebrity reverence that we have for celebrities and putting people on a pedestal because when you're young, it's natural because you need a role model. You need someone to emulate. You need someone to to aspire to be like. But sometimes you meet those people and it's just not the same. Maybe it's a bad day or a bad week or a bad month, but it's not the same. And you just realize, okay, this person is flawed like everybody, including myself. So I need to relax. You know, I need, I just need to chill. They're flawed like everybody. And I learned that fairly young, but that's something 
that I don't believe uh, anymore today. But I learned that fairly. I learned that maybe at in like when I started taking acting classes at 13 or something like that. Are you planning on opening a film studio in Conakry anytime in the future? I'm planning on opening a film studio there. And my production company, Mansanzinger Productions, will open a studio there in 2021 in Conakry, Mansanzinger Studios, and we'll be able to produce our own projects and maybe even produce other people's projects at some point when we build up the team and have more people and ship over our equipment and acquire more. But the goal is to make more projects in Guinea, make more projects in Africa in general, and tell our stories. There's so many things that I want to do, so many stories that I want to tell. I meet young actors, actresses, writers, filmmakers, uh, aspiring producers, influencers in Guinea all the time. And they're like, hey, I just need some equipment or I just need a space to shoot. Help me out. What do you think about this? Read this script. Give me notes. You know, give me advice. Produce this for me. And there's a lot of talent there now, and people are making it online on their own. And I would love to go back and not only create the projects that I want to create and the TV series that I want to create and the more documentaries and more narrative projects in long form and short forms and more audiovisual projects, more photo projects. And I also want to empower young people to do their own projects and show them how to do their projects. And pretty much everything I've learned, I would love to share that with the youth and make their journey a little bit easier than I was because it's not necessarily easy to be uh, an actor and filmmaker or to be an, a working actor and filmmaker. It's a blessing. And then to be able to produce your own stuff and to be able to travel, it's, it's amazing. It's a blessing. You know, I'm truly blessed and it's onwards and upwards, but you have to remember to give back and allow other people to find that freedom too and to inspire them and show them how to do what you've been able to do because it's, it's a blessing and it's all about information. Tell us about your favorite project that you starred in or that you acted in. That's a tough one. <laughs> My favorite movie that I, that I filmed or that I'm in, that's a tough one because there's so many, there's so many that, that are you know near and dear to my heart and sometimes it's the rehearsal period that's better than the actual filming period sometimes it's when the film is done promoting the film that's better sometimes it's just a camaraderie on set while we, when we're eating lunch so that's a tough question but there is a movie that i love that i'm not in <laughs> and uh there's a movie that i love uh from when i it came out when i was in high school it's called finding forrester and um it's by gus van sant it has uh, Sean Connery in it, Rob Brown, Busta Rhymes. I love that movie because it's like a coming of age. It is a coming of age story. And at that time in my life, there are a lot of parallels in the film and, uh, you know, parallels in the film and what I was going through at the time in high school in New York. So I love that movie. It's just, it's just a beautifully made film and it inspired me a lot to continue and to pursue acting and filmmaking. So shout out to Gus Van Sant. Uh, I must ask this question for everyone that's going to listen to this podcast and to your fans all over the world. Are you single or are you in a relationship? <sighs> that's a tough question. Um, well, currently, officially, legally, I'm single. Yeah, I'm single. Next question. <laughs> Ooh, you got to tell us your top five celebrity encounters. <laughs> That's tough because some of them are going to watch and they're going to be like, you didn't say my name. My top five celebrity encounters, Whoopi Goldberg, Samuel Jackson, Denzel Washington, Sean Puffy Combs or Diddy, and I'll say Madonna. But so I can't say all the names. There's so, it's too many. What was that like? I mean, at first it was exciting and, and stuff like that. And now, I honestly, I, I view them as my peers, not to bring them down, but I view them as my peers. We're all in the same space. We're just at a different level in that space. So I, I just, it's normal. It's it's second nature to me. I don't freak out or anything like that anymore. I'm, I'm used to it. But it, it's great because it's telling me, hey, well, you're, in the, you're moving in the right circles or you're around, <laughs> you're in the mix, <laughs> you're close enough to where you're headed with your project. So it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. Where do you see Africa in five years? I think in Africa, there are revolutions looming and revolutions in development. And I don't only mean political revolutions. I also mean revolutions in, you know, in food, revolutions in real estate, 
revolutions in education, revolutions in transportation, revolutions in lifestyle, revolutions in every facet of life that will drastically change the continent. And also, I think unification, a real unification, is what can help us because individually we're not that powerful. But once Africa is truly, truly united, Northeast, Southwest, Central, <laughs> when it's truly united, then we'll have power. And when we have one currency, when we communicate, when we help each other, we'll be okay. But there are revolutions looming, things that need to change. The old way that things are uh, being done is not working. It's only keeping a few people happy and it's keeping the fat cats fat. But there are other people who need to be supported and need help and need uh, an opportunity and need a safe living environment and need to have access to a good education and need good hospitals and need safe food and need a lot of things. So we have the potential to be the greatest place on the planet because we have a lot of young people who are ready to learn and eager to work. And we also have a, the majority of the world's natural resources. And it's being mismanaged. Historically, it's been mismanaged. And a lot of people are winning and eating off of Africa as they have been since colonization. So we need to take everything back. We need to take the power back. We need to work together. And that's the key to our salvation or our our eventual happiness and success. So I think there are revolutions looming. Everything's going to change. And uh, we're going to use cinema to change it. And I urge everyone to revolutionize Africa using whatever medium that they work in or excel in or are fluent in or want to work in. And I think that's the key. What would you say to all the aspiring actors, directors, uh, movie creators, content creators? What would you tell them? I'm going to tell them, keep going. Don't stop for anything and anybody. Just keep going. If you want to make it, you will make it. If you're willing to work hard, put the time in, study your craft, create, create, and create more, you're going to make it. Do not let people knock you off your journey. Life is too short. This is it. You could die tomorrow. You could die today. <laughs> Just do what you love. Stay focused. Find a way to earn money doing what you love and support yourself. If you have a family, find a way to support your family while you do it. But most importantly, do what makes you happy. Do what you love and do it the best you can possibly do it and strive to do it better every day and strive to be better every day and learn to adapt because the game is changing every single day and you're one piece of information away from the success that you want, whatever success means to you. And your parents will come around if they love you. They will come around. If they don't love you, then maybe they don't need to come around. That concludes this interview. Thank you so much, Momo Dion, for coming on Alasara, and I look forward to you coming on again. Thank you for having me, Dima Chow. It's been a pleasure. If you're not already, please follow me on Instagram. Also, check out my blog site where you'll be able to purchase my Alasara t-shirts to support the movement. That was the first episode of Alasara. I hope that inspired you to follow your dreams and make history. Make sure you guys tune into the next episode, and remember to always bridge the gap.